this week we're starting our series on the chosen. So if you didn't know what that's from, if you haven't seen it, it's this opening scene of the first episode of the chosen. And it's also our text for today. So you have got to know what Isaiah uh, 43. So I watched the, the first episode of this thing. I was very strict, struck by it. It was, it was actually really, really well done. You know, often when you watch uh, Christian movies in particular, but any movie that's kind of done with a low budget, you kind of, ex- kind of expect it to uh, maybe not perform as well, but maybe have, still have a good message, good truth to it, right? And these are really, really well done. There's a lot of very, very little details. Um, the story of the, the lady that you are just introduced to as it unfolds and isn't revealed until the very end of the episode, it just, it just floors you. Knocks you under. It's a very good movie. Very, not I should say movie, it's a series of eight of them. And uh, that's what we're going to go through, and it'll lead us all the way up to Palm Sunday. We'll just kind of introduce ourselves to Jesus as they walk us through and introduce ourselves to Jesus and, and how that relates with us. and. And also how Jesus himself relates with us, being uh, Emmanuel and God incarnate. But um, if you would like to watch the series, I, I highly recommend it. Because as I go through, I may forget what I have or have not said. And I might be in like three weeks from now doing episode four and pulling a, a sermon from an illustration from the show. And end up coming back to the first episode and giving spoilers away. So... Uh, just fair warning, I may give spoilers in the coming weeks. So take an hour to watch it. You can find it on YouTube for free. They have an app, it's just called The Chosen. You can watch it on your phone or any of your device. But you can also cast it to a Roku TV and um, I can't remember what it was called up there, um, like Angel Bit or something like that. It's actually an app on the Roku TV or a Roku device that allows you to stream it from like your phone or something to your TV. Um, and some people have seen some of the episodes at Walmart, but I'm not sure if others have them or have all of them. Uh, but they're all completely free. Uh, they, they really want to just pro- have this as a, a to, to provide for people to get to know and to, and to uh, I guess, to know Jesus. And, and, to, and to be able to, to relate with the gospel message personally. And so they might find Christ as a personal savior. But um, last week we kind of talked about how God formed us in our womb. Like, like, he, he knew us before we were formed in our mother's womb. And, and you might remember the, the small vision that I, that I launched for the Revive Family Ministry Pregnancy Center uh, that we would like to, uh, and to pursue as an outreach ministry and service to the community. And this kind of dives into that a little further. But as we kind of dive into our faith in this, this new year, I guess you could say, we take a fresh look at what it means to live faithfully or to be, um, to put our trust in Christ. And so I just want to, if you have gotten to Isaiah 43, I want to just read the text to you again as we move forward and begin with this. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not be set will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Siva in your in your stead, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you. I'm gonna read that again. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you. I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Be not afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. 
Bring my sons from far away, from afar, and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I have formed and made. I continue on just a couple of verses. I see something else happening. We have those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Which of their gods foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring in their witness to prove they are right, so the others may hear and say it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. That is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this, this word of affirmation, that you are our God and we are your chosen people. To be your witnesses, but also to know your love. Lord, I pray that in the, during this message today that any words that I have might just fall on deaf ears, Lord, but those who have ears, let them hear the word from you, the word that you have for, set aside for each one of us, for our lives to be transformed in the image and likeness of you. Lord, pray that you would just anoint this message, that it would, and that it would be, just give you honor and praise and glory. That's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> I first want to kind of start off, we don't get to this point yet, but the movie is called The Chosen because it's on Jesus Christ, right? Jesus the Messiah, and it means anointed. So uh, Christ, we get it from the Greek word Christos, right? And, and that's where we get Christ from. Christos in Greek means anointed. So to be anointed would be to um, have like oil poured on you and to be consecrated or set apart for God, for God's purpose. And so, Jesus Christ would be the anointed, the set aside, the chosen one, because consecrated would also mean to be set apart, to be chosen, to be selected. And so this is where we get the chosen from, as far as the TV series goes. But in, in this text, we see that he's setting apart Israel as the, the chosen one, but he's not speaking to a singular person, he's speaking to a people. And it's important for us to realize that for ourselves, well, Christ is the appointed one. He is the Christos. He is the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior. That has extended to us who have faith and believe in Him. And because of that, we have no reason to fear, which is the concept of the text. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. And I have called you by name, and you are mine. comforting words from the Lord. But I think there's a little bit more we can come into this. The fact that He's redeemed us, right? He's, he has redeemed us. And then He talks about how He's chosen us. Right? He's chosen to be a people. But is He just talking about Israel? That as in the nation? Uh, just like God is? So certainly, this is who Isaiah is talking about at the time. And other commentaries might look up, might look up and say that well, they're, they're speaking of back and forth of possibly raising up, uh, uh, raising up a Jeremiah, actually. But there's more to it than that. Down here it says in a uh, what I've added. No, verse seven. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. So not just everybody by his name, but also anybody for his glory, which I certainly believe that we could look at all of creation and say he has made it for his glory, which would include all of us. But he further goes on to explain, he says, whom I formed and made, just to make it clear, in case we can infer that everybody made was made for his glory and it is therefore called by name. He has chosen, he has redeemed. He is called by name. We are his special, his prized possession. Uh, Isaiah 40, I don't want to get up here just because it's just a reference so far. Isaiah 40, God's trying to make the same point. And he, he leads off in this little section, there's actually sections of Isaiah that they believe is all written at once. 
And this is kind of a start of it. He talks about the stars in the sky. He says, look up in the sky. Look up at all the stars that you see. And he goes, I have put all of them there. Not one of them is missing. In the grander scheme of things, we have this vast universe with all of these stars all over within them. And God is not just saying, oh, I just, this is my creation, I, I put them there. He is in every single one of them is there. Which means that he was very intentional about every one of them. And he is saying that to point out, because this is part of Israel's history, that they get numerous of the stars in the sky. That his creation, his people, every person that he has created, every person that he knew before they were formed in the womb, was on purpose, was intentional. He knew you as an individual, every single one of us. So then he calls you, he says, I have called you by name. You are mine. He knows you by name. He knew you by name before you were born. Go with me to Mark 1. Probably should have just led with this because I kind of already gave it away. But... Mark 1 says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. In Hebrew text, it's written as Messiah. But in Greek, it's Christos, the anointed one. Jesus Christ was chosen. Jesus, I shouldn't say Jesus Christ, let's say Jesus of Nazareth was the chosen one, the set aside one, whose God's name was in him, to use the, the, the text from Exodus. I hid that God's name is in him. And it is in him and through him, the chosen one, that, we would, that he would be the Messiah, or the Hebrew word, you know, the one who would save us and redeem us. And just as God said, I have redeemed you. And through Christ, he has redeemed every single one of us. That comes with three important messages for redemption. The first one, as we see in the movie here, is we don't need to fear. We have nothing to fear. When we're going through fires in life, when we're going through struggles, God is with us. He doesn't rescue us from the fire, but he's with us in the fire. Just as he was with uh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, right? They went into the flame. If he went into the lions then with Daniel, right? When we go through the trials, when we go through the struggles, he is there with you in them. Because as you walk with him through the trials, you are refined. As you seek him in there, you find the third point. That he loves you. That he loves you. Amen. And the third is that we would be his witnesses. That we would be his witnesses. What does it, what does it mean to be a, a witness to something? What does that mean to be a Wait, I remember when I was on the police department, we have to do a lot of interviews with people, right? and they would inter we, we, we would interview them. There might be more than one witness. And we could tell a lot about how they talked, how they carried themselves, whether they're being honest. Sometimes it's just in part. I don't know how many people I remember interviewing that were just scared. They were just outright scared to be involved. I, I, I had one particular instance that was really troubling and hard for me. It was, a, it was a guy who was actually stabbed in the neck by his girlfriend, and there was only one witness that saw it, and it was a passerby. 
And, and he lived, he, he was fine, he was, um, some stitches and some careful watching, but um, the witness saw it and gave a, a great statement to it. Though when it came time for court, he disappeared. He got scared. And I think sometimes we have this boldness within our faith. We have this assurance that Christ loves us, that he's redeemed us, but then we're actually faced with the trials of life, and we fold under the pressure. That roaring lion scares us. But there's consequences for, for that. After that, they, they were struggling to get a conviction because they didn't know if they could convict without a witness. And within a few months later, I was working at the hospital, and he showed up full code because he had been stabbed in the heart with a steak knife, and he didn't make it this time. We are for the sake, we are witnesses for the sake of redeeming lives. That's, that's the second Corinthians Five verse that follows with our, our phoenix that we have a new life in Christ. We are a new creation. And for those who have put their faith in Him that have been heirs to the ministry of reconciliation. His love is important as it transforms us and gives us assurance. But it is extremely important that our witness of how we live our lives testifies to that love and that assurance that we have. We boast very much about the the assurance that we have in him to get us through struggles, but when we're in the struggles, that's where our real witness and testimony come through. <coughs> when we have some witnesses in the police department that would have something that's just completely not true, but very convincing. And most of the time, they wanted to be somebody who knows. Does that make sense? You've always had somebody who's like a know-it-all, or maybe they're just a person who knows all the juicy details of every bit of drama in everybody's life. We probably know those more than we know know-it-alls. People like love drama. But as you see the truth unfold, it starts to show their colors. It starts to show their true selves. Our witness is important. Our witness is important. Because we are the sent. We are the call. And Christ calls us by name. What would it be like for you today? Just kind of think about this for a minute. I don't know what anybody's going through, what they have gone through, or what they're, maybe they're going to about to go through something, um, a, a surgery, or, or a family member who's, who's very ill, or, or struggles at work, or whatever, whatever trials you may be facing. Maybe it's relational issues, either with somebody you really care about, or maybe it's just friendships, or neighbors, or coworkers, whatever the case may be, whatever trials you might be going through that are really eating you away. They're, they're, they're causing you to have anger, resentment, and jealousy, and, and, and just hatred. These things that are bottling up in you. There are many different types of trials that we can face. But what would it look like? For the God who makes the blind see, the deaf hear, the God who makes the, the paralyzed walk again, who turns a, a couple of fish and some loaves and a couple of loaves of bread and feeds 10,000 plus people. What would it look like for the God who parts the waters? The God who sits with you in the fire. Like it was more like a sauna. Just hanging out. Right? The God who knew you before you were formed in the womb. What would it like if you just called out your name? 
out loud. Then those song I can, I can only imagine. He said, I can only imagine what it would be like to stand before you. In fact, I don't know if I could stand. Maybe I'd kneel. I don't know. I would want to sing, but I don't even know if I could talk. Yeah. Right? I think when God calls us, we know. We know. And maybe some people testify to that having an audible voice, they can hear it loud and clear as day, even though they could be sitting in a pew or a seat or at work. They can hear it loud as could be, but nobody else hears it. Some people have said, I know that it wasn't out loud, but there was a sense that I could hear it within the depths of my soul, my name. I just knew it was from God. Have you heard that? Have you heard that call? If not, have you been listening? There's a lot of distractions in this world, a lot of things calling out, a lot of kids picking at things and throwing water bottles. But what if it was more than that? What if it was more than just calling your name? What if it was saying, I love you? You're cherished. You are my prized possession. Now go do this. The one thing you don't want to do. You know, like public speaking. That was a personal touch. I'm not. I, I was never somebody to get up and talk to people. Never. I hated teaching classes in the Marines. And those are usually the guys I was close with. I didn't even like teaching them. But he says, fear not. Fear not. What is God? saying to you? What is he calling out to you? Is it just your name? Does he just want you to hear him? To know that his presence for, for you to have assurance that, his, that he resides within you and, and in your heart that, that he sees you, he knows you by name. Perhaps he I want you to feel love. Perhaps he has called you to something, a life much more rich and fulfilling, no matter how scary it is. Our mission here at Revival Church is to be the best, to come together to worship and to give honor to God, to be the best version of ourselves, the version God created us to be. We can only know that if we're hearing who God is calling us. I want you to just kind of close your eyes. Just that you can't close your eyes if you're holding them open with me. Close it. Just close your eyes. Just kind of listen. Lord. Let us hear your voice today. Let us hear your call out from the clouds. Let us hear as we are your chosen people that you love us. Let us have assurance that we have been redeemed. And Lord, let us know what does that mean? And how will we be your witnesses in the world today? What is our part, our role in the body of Christ? To be a part of the ministry of reconciliation. What have you called us? Have you called us to give up something in our lives? Bad habit, addiction. Maybe it's the way we talk, engage with others. Maybe it's anger or jealousy that we just need to surrender to exemplify and display your love and forgiveness that you have so shown us on the cross. 
through Jesus Christ. Maybe it's to pick up our role in ministry, whether it be through the Pregnancy Center or Revive Family Ministries, to be a participant, whether it's whether it's a, a volunteer, some kind of coordinator, somebody that's going to learn what it's going to take for the church to be a supportive community and family to those who really have no other option from abortion. They give them the social and economical support that they need to have the assurance and comfort that they know. They can live life in abundance with children. Perhaps it's a oh, means of serving in some other capacity. That's been on the heart and mind of somebody here. Would you speak to us now? Jesus, I thank you for this good word today. I thank you for your, the redemption that you have sent to us through Christ. I thank you that you would form us in the likeness of your image. That we would be a prized possession. And that we are beloved by you. But I thank you for the redemption of Jesus Christ once again. I just, there's nothing I could ever do to deserve forgiveness, redemption, or love, Lord, but you do it. And because you have done it, because you promised it and fulfilled it, Lord, I know that you are true to continue that good work in me and in every person here, Lord. I pray that you your voice is heard, that others are listening to hear what will make the calling to you, to give guidance and direction into their life, to be the best version they have, to live, to lead, and most importantly, to love like you did, and like you do. May you reign in our hearts and in our lives, and may our witness and our testimonies be powerful in the sight of our town here. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.